Welcome everyone to Sunday service at Ananda Village and thank you very much for the wonderful chanting this morning. Got lots of energy and uh, Yogananda used to say that the sound of a drum would loosen the vrittis of karma in our spines so that we could burn them up in meditation and I think that was definitely happening there. <laughs> so this is Nitai Duranja and I'm Lisa Powers and it's our joy to share our Sunday inspirational service with you today. Today's reading from Rays of the One Light Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda is By Thinking Can We Arrive at Understanding. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. There are many places in the Gospels where we see Jesus in open conflict with the Pharisees. That is to say, with man-made as opposed to true mystical tradition. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, we see a good example of how they and he locked horns. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem came and asked Jesus, Why do your disciples break our ancient tradition and eat their food without washing their hands properly first? Jesus, after scolding them for their hypocrisy and observing lesser rules so carefully while ignoring the much more important ones, said, Listen and understand this thoroughly. It is not what goes into a man's mouth that makes him, un makes him common or unclean. It is what comes out of a man's mouth that makes him unclean. It wasn't that Jesus counseled against such wholesome practices as washing one's hands before eating. In an age, however, when lesser rules were given too much importance relative to the truly important observances, cleansing the heart of impure desires, for example, he emphasized the supreme importance of loving God and communing with him. The Pharisees, the orthodox religionists of his day, in other words, had brought true religion down to a level of intellectual hair splitting. They mistakenly considered the way to understanding to lie through a minefield of definitions, which they tried to refine to ultimate exactitude. Jesus taught, however, that the intellect alone can never lead one to truth. Without love, indeed, there is no ultimate verity. Without fixity of purpose, born of the heart's devotion, the intellect wanders in endlessly. It cannot settle for long on anything. As the Bhagavad Gita says in the second chapter, the intellects of those who lack fixity of spiritual purpose are inconstant, their interests endlessly ramified. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. to start with a reading from Whispers. <clears throat> See if I can find my glasses, sorry. <laughs> mm. 
<clears throat> Flood me with thy omnipresent love. O fountain of love, flood the lowlands of our love for home and family with thy omnipresent love. O mighty source of all our rivers of desire, teach us not to cut ourselves off from thee, hunting on dry sands of sense satisfaction. Love is our soul's birthright. We demand now that all the rivers of our cravings be redirected through valleys of humility, eager self-sacrifice and concern for others, until reinforced by thy torrential blessings, they merge in the ocean of all fulfillment in thee. Bless us that the rivulets of our sympathy, affection, and love lose not themselves in the sands of dreary selfishness. Let the little, lonely, separately moving streamlets of our love, which come from thee, merge at last in the vastness of thy perfect love. So this morning, uh, we have a fascinating and certainly timely topic. It says the role of reasoning and the role of thinking, role of the intellect on the spiritual path. It's timely because we are coming out of a, an era where the intellect was heavily depended upon um, to, in the uh, search for knowledge and the search for truth. I don't think it was necessarily bad at that time. It was simply fit the time. If you go back in history, which we're going to do a little bit this morning in a couple of ways, you come out of the Middle Ages, <clears throat> and what was it that freed people from the bondage of narrow-minded narrow dogma, dogmatism? But the intellect, the people started questioning. People started asking questions and trying to get uh, answers, not just uh, blindly trusting their ministers and priests. And there was uh, good progress in that. But we've come to another part of uh, human evolution where we are starting to outgrow that dependence on the intellect and reasoning on the, for spiritual truth. Um, when I went to college, which was not that long ago from my perspective, <laughs> <laughs> it was a sad experience for me. Um, because I went to college at the same time I was starting to awaken spiritually, and I was looking for spiritual truths, and they weren't there. Um, colleges, maybe they've changed a little bit in the last 40 years, but at the time I went there, um, there were good places to go if you wanted to find out the you know, insights about physics, or maybe political science, or uh, English literature, things of that sort. But I really wasn't interested in any of that. I really wanted truth. And I was very frustrated because um, people kept presenting their the teachings as if they were truth, but it didn't have a ring to it. it didn't have, what it was missing, was, of course, was feeling. What it was missing was a direct experience, uh, something beyond just a concept. And so um, I managed to stick it out only because there was a war going on, and if you <laughs> left the college, you went to the war <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <coughs> Swami had a little easier out, he just left <laughs> um, to continue his search. But the, uh, this whole idea that, that truth is more than a concept um, goes back a, a long ways. Uh, we're in our, we have a, the, the joy uh, here at the Nanda of developing a whole new educational system based on education for life. The, you got to hear this high school students this morning um, playing. Um, it's my joy to be able to spend uh, every week with them and kind of exploring these new ter terrain. We also are building a college here that uh, trying to base it not on, but trying to place the role of the intellect in, in, con in the context, not to make it the, the great top of the pyramid, but to just say it's, it's a tool, it's a tool. We have a, the Education for Life says that we basically have four tools to develop in our uh, development, tools of maturity. The body, the feelings, the will, and the intellect. And all of them are vital to a vibrant uh, being to be able to make the use of this incarnation to the greatest extent possible. But none in and of themselves can be the end all or the be all. The body, obviously, uh, we develop it to, so that it doesn't get in the way. We don't keep tripping over the fact that we're always getting a cold or we're always you know, having an injury or something. We want to develop a lifestyle that creates strong, healthy bodies so we can use it to do whatever we need to do in this life. Um, you can transcend the body, which is really nice. Uh, 
people have those experiences, uh, you know, periodically in sports or dance, where all of a sudden your your movement just takes you beyond the body and you experience another level of consciousness. So it can be a springboard. The same with feelings. Uh, you work with feelings, um, you know, moodiness. You ha we have to learn how to deal with moodiness, that we don't capture our consciousness in sour moods and we're you know griping because of something or we're just complaining those kinds of things we have to learn that there's a level of feeling that goes beyond those superficial emotion motions and when we transcend when we break through those those smaller uh feelings we find the doorway to the greatest of all feelings intuition and the, the sense of feeling sense that is a guide for truth in our life a guide for direction with the will, um, it's vital to, important to practice the will, to develop the will, because without the will, you can't accomplish anything in life. So you need to learn how to set goals and achieve them, whether it's getting your math sets in on time <laughs> or <laughs> something even bigger. <laughs> um, but as you learn those, you learn that you, you have a tremendous willpower. You can basically realize that you can accomplish anything in your life if you set yourself to it. However, that's only one step, a step on the way because there's a farther step. And that step is to learn to transcend the will by learning to, to harmonize our will with divine will and to offer our will and all that we've developed into that flow where God can work through us and achieve the, the, whatever um, is meant to, be, to happen in our lifetime. The same with the intellect. The intellect, intellect can, is a wonderful tool for discriminating, for deciding what what makes sense on this plane, what, what doesn't? And to be able to not spend your, life, your time just banging your head against the walls of, uh, de of delusion, just to say, oh, wait a minute, now I can learn from that and I can go on. But as it says in the, in the reading today and in the affirmation, it says there comes a point where you have to, after you've you got your focus, you've got your uh, goals set, you just basically open up and you start to be guided more and more by that attunement, by that experience of the divine. We, um, in one of the high school classes, we're, we're looking at uh, Greek myths. Uh, you might have studied Greek myths when you were in school too. We're trying to do it from a little bit different angle because we're tying it into, for those of you familiar with the yugas, um, as to use the myths as tools uh, to discover higher, little hints of higher consciousness. To make it really short, um, basically the teachings uh, that Yogananda brought to us said that we are come out of a higher age, went through a very low dark age, and now we're coming back up into a higher age again. However, it makes a big dip. And we've always, I, the fellows and I who were in the class were exploring, well, what, if we're over here on this upward uh, swing of consciousness evolution, maybe we can get some clues if we look across the gap and look at what was happening during that downward sli <laughs> slide and see, what maybe, what maybe there's some uh, hints about what's gonna, what we're growing into. So two things came up that I wanted to share today. Um, one of the first things was something I'd never heard of before, which uh, was fascinating. Um, they're called the Eleusinian Mysteries. <clears throat> and these are, this is about, for those of you who are familiar with the yugas, it's almost exactly across from where we are. It's about as high up in the uh, descending Dwapara Yuga as we are into the ascending Dwapara Yuga now. It said the Eleusinian Mysteries, <coughs> for, which for hundreds of years, they helped man, as Cicero said, to live with joy and to die with hope. But their influence did not last, very likely because nobody was allowed to teach their ideas openly or write about them. <coughs> There's these little hints that there were these traditions that were coming down at that age that brought people a sense of purpose and direction in life. They were passed on secretly at that stage, at least, and they, they died out at about that time. And I was just fascinated by the thought, well, there's some parallel with Kriya Yoga, because as we go into this upswing of consciousness, what do we have? Finally, we have this, um, these teachings of Kriya Yoga, the initiation into Kriya Yoga, which is also secret at this point, uh, but not as secret as it used to be. And... Uh, it's the thing that does teach us to live with, with, live with joy and to die with hope because it gives us a deeper purpose to life. So we see this swing, this swing going uh, back into a higher age, a higher consciousness. Another story we came across, which tied in directly with today, is a myth that you all, some of you might have heard of before. It's the myth of Cupid, Cupid and Psyche. 
<coughs> and I'll first I'll just tell uh, uh, the myth, and you can see what you can do about trying to get the deeper meanings. Because there's a tr tradition, not only in Greece and the West, but also in India, that as the world slips into a lower, lower consciousness, the rishis, the sages, try to capture and preserve some basic truths. But they know that in lower consciousness, people are simply incapable of understanding them. So if they teach them directly, people will just ignore them and they'll be lost. So they encapsulate them into a story. And they make the story exciting and it's the kind of thing that you'll, anybody can remember, even in a lower age, and they'll pass it on. Hopefully then when things come back out, then those, st those jewels will be still there and people can un unwrap them and get excited about learning them again. So Cupid and Psyche. Um, you've probably heard of Cupid. He's got a little bit of a bad reputation. <laughs> but that's also, I think, comes out of lower ages. He had a higher octave to him also, uh, more than Valentine's Day. <coughs> um, so Psyche was a young woman, a girl, who was reported to be the most beautiful woman in the whole world. And she was so beautiful that all the guys were just completely mesmerized by her. Just everybody walked, watched her walk around and just was, oh my gosh. <laughs> and <laughs> the problem was, though, that she was so beautiful and she attracted so much attention that people started not paying attention to the gods, and in particular, particular goddess Venus. Venus was being neglected. People weren't going to the temple and honoring her. They were th thinking about Psyche all the time. So she got, of course, upset, as the Greek gods and goddesses <laughs> tend to do. <laughs> 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 and she had a son, though. She asked her son, who's Cupid. He said, Cupid, I need your help. Can you please take care of this? Take one of your arrows, and I want you to shoot this girl and make her fall in love with the most ugly, impossible, uh, being on the planet, <laughs> and we'll get rid of her. <coughs> <laughs> so Cupid goes out to do his mother's bidding, and unfortunately, though, he looks at uh, Psyche before he shoots. <laughs> 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 and he falls hopelessly in love with her, and uh, he can't, he can't shoot her. Um, so, but the problem is that Psyche she can't find a husband. She, the, the, all the men that are interested in her, they worship her and they uh, are enthralled with her beauty, but nobody is willing to marry her. So she's very lonely, and um, so the, her father gets, is really concerned about getting her married, of course, and he goes to an oracle, and the oracle says that she has to go out on this very high, abandoned precipice and wait there for this being who's going to come and take her as... Um, his wife, his bride. Well, she's really she's petrified. Of course, everybody is because they assume it's going to be some kind of monster that comes and gobbles her up or something. <coughs> but she does. She follows through. She goes out on the cliffside and she's sitting there and just, you know, sobbing because this is, you know, this is going to be the end one way or the other. When she, in the middle of this, all of a sudden things start to shift and she starts to feel these soft breezes. We call them, call them the zephyrs. And the zephyrs come, and they just kind of enwrap her, and they're so sweet, and they just, she kind of falls asleep. When she wakes up, she's been carried to this very beautiful meadow, and she's in this soft grass. And she hears these beautiful sing singing in the background, and she wakes up, and she follows the singing over to a palace, of course, a, ca a castle. And the palace is filled with beautiful things, uh, wonderful foods to eat, and these voices keep chanting in the background, kind of guiding her emotions through the through the palace, and she has this growing sense that she's going to meet her husband, her, her, the, 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 the person who's going to be, um, she's going to be married to. And, but it doesn't happen all day, and then it gets close to the, the evening, and she realizes it's always going to happen in the nighttime. So she goes to bed, and sure enough, in the, in the middle of the night, she feels this presence next to her, and she, it's this beautiful, loving presence, and she feels, she feels completely satisfied. She completely you know, feels this, this love that she's been yearning for. And uh, in the morning, though, the, the whoever is in the bed <laughs> mentions to her, says, now, we're married, but you can't look at me. You can't look at me. Uh, that's, uh, if, I, if you look at me, um, it'll be the end of our relationship. And so she's okay with that for a while. She's okay because she loves, she has the feeling of, this feeling of fulfillment is so complete and so total that she's okay with not, having, not looking at it. Well, then, of course, there's a little... Um, <coughs> Um, 
mischievous <laughs> part comes in. And she has two sisters. She has two sisters that aren't quite as beautiful as she is, and they've always been a little jealous of her. And they find out that she didn't die on that promontory, that she was actually taken to this palace. And they find out where she is, and they come, and, they <coughs> and her husband senses this, and he says, your sisters are coming to visit. And he says, but you have to promise not to tell them anything about me. And she says, all right. So she goes to talk with them, and they start asking her, of course, questions about who her husband is. And they finally figure it out that she really doesn't know what he looks like because she never gives them a straight answer. <coughs> and finally it comes out that uh, the sisters say, well, you've got to find out. He's probably a monster. He's probably a wicked monster. And yeah, he's being loving right now, but he's going to eat you up one day, and you're going <laughs> to... It won't be a happy ending. He says, you should look out for yourself. You need to you find out who he is. So she kind of waffles and starts to have doubts. and Well, I really don't know what he looks like. And yeah, I, I do feel that tremendous love, but I want to look at him. And so curiosity gets the best of her. And so that night, after, after there, it's dark, uh, dark, and he's come to bed, she, he's asleep, so she lights the lamp, and she looks at him. And he's not a monster. He's this beautiful, handsome guy. And she's just completely, oh, of course, this is exactly what. But of course, she's, her hand shakes, and the lamp tips and the hot oil falls on Cupid and wakes him up. And he looks and he says, oh my gosh. <laughs> he says, and then he leaves. He just goes up. And of course, she's all sobbing and um, s sad. And I, there are probably different endings. The, this, and this one I read actually had a nice ending because he finally kind of reconciles with her and they live happily ever after eventually and uh, things worked out. But when we were going through this, this happened. I went into the story this week, and I was oh, right in the middle of it. I said, oh my gosh, this fits into Sunday service. <laughs> 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 and the way it fit in, for me at least, I'm sure these myths have many interpretations, but psyche, of course, uh, what, what is psyche? Psyche, psychology, psychiatry. Psyche has to do with the mind. Sometimes it's called the soul, but it, it comes down to us through history, um, is that part. And if we think of it as basically the little soul, the, the jivan, jiva, then you see, what does the soul want? The soul wants divine love. The soul wants, wants that complete com feeling of absorption in the divine, and it yearns for it. And it, it can't get it in most in ordinary channels, so it's looking for something more. It's looking for a, a source to it. And when we, you know, that the, op the opportunity we have at this point in history through, through these higher teachings that are coming back on the planet is that the soul can have that direct experience of God. The soul can be completely satisfied with the divine experience. Um, it wasn't that way, you know, 500,000 years ago, there was these things in between, the churches and the hierarchy, the clergy. But now it's available. And it comes, it comes to us. But the temptation is to want to click into that mental mode, that intellectual mode, and observe it, and analyze it, and kind of try to conceptualize it and pin it down the way we've been trained with our minds. And we always find that that's when it disappears. <laughs> it's if you're having that divine experience, if you're having that inner fulfillment, and all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, what's happening? <laughs> and you step back. And all of a sudden, it's gone. It just disappears, just like Cupid disappeared from Psyche. And I thought, that's a really deep teaching. That's a really deep teaching that I, th I do think that's one of those things that was encapsulated to bring down. And now we need to know that. Now we need to know that it's we don't need to measure the divine experience. We don't need to try to categorize it. We don't need to explain it. We simply need to be open to it. And the more open we can be, the more unconditionally open, the more it can permeate us, the more it can change us deep from, from, wi from within and can start to purify every other aspect of our lives. The, the intellect, you know, the will, the feelings, the body, all these things can be consecrated in a sense with that divine presence. And that whole, our whole evolution then comes from the inside out, it comes from that, that deep experience. So our role at this point in history is to Make sure, bring that consciousness back on the planet, that it's possible. And to do the homework in ourselves to make it a reality, not just a theory. We all have these, we have blessings. Almost, I'm sure everybody in this room has had blessings where they had that experience of inner 
inner enlightenment, inner joy, inner peace. may not have lasted very long, but it's there. It's there as a little seed thought that we're given. And when we're given those blessings, then we just kind of, what we can, well, how can we react? We can get, first of all, we can get egotistical. Aha, oh, I had a spiritual experience. <laughs> I'm pretty neat. I'm different. <laughs> and you may never get another one that way. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just kind of, kind of lose track with it. Say, oh, yeah, that happens. Oh, gosh, that happened a long time ago. And I don't quite remember it. Maybe it wasn't real. Maybe it wasn't for actual. And you kind of go on and you get lost in the sands of lanes of delusion. But if we take them as a a good modern-day organic gardener would do with permaculture, <laughs> and, and we, we work with it, we protect it, we nurture it, we build on it, and we make it bigger and bigger and bigger, just, just like Jesus said. He said the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. At first it's very small and tiny, hardly uh, able to notice, but if we fertil fertilize it, cultivate it, it grows and to become the biggest plant uh, on, in the garden. So our job is to do whatever we can. We have the blessings. Um, all around the planet now, there are these places of light that are manifesting. Uh, it, it is a new age. It is a higher age. It's coming. We had the um, blessing. Uh, the high school takes these service adventures every year, and um, the girls went west to warm climates <laughs> in Hawaii, and the boys went east to cold climates in New England and Quebec. But in both places, we found centers of light. We found centers where people are cultivating their spiritual awareness and uh, had the chance to uh, join with them. Personally, for me, we had one which we'll be continuing. We'll have some return visits from this one community in the next couple of months. It's from a place called the City Ecologique in Quebec, a French-Canadian community. And I had so much fun finding out about them because they don't come, their tradition is not from India. Um, it's, it comes from all places, Bulgaria. <laughs> and that was probably one of the last places I ever expected a deep spiritual tradition to come from. But as I got to, as I've looked into it more and more, I see so many overlaps, so many completely uh, harmonious uh, teachings come from it. So it, it just, to me, it's just a manifestation that what's happening on the planet is beyond any particular human limitation. It's just a raising of consciousness. It's a raising of consciousness that's happening every, everywhere. And we can now start to learn to work together to cultivate it. These communities like Ananda, Ananda's um, World Brotherhood Colonies, those are the laboratories. Those are the laboratories for making this real. Because we live in a planet that's still, you know, hugely unbalanced in the form of materialism. Hugely unbalanced in the form that somehow happiness lies through the senses. Um, it, it bombards us every single time we turn on the radio, we look at a TV, we go to a video, watch a video. There's always, unless it's a very, very special um, thing we're watching, we're going to have these little hints that pull us back. No, it's, it's the physical reality is the dominant one. That's the one that's more important than everything else. Spiritual realities are, eh, if you have time, maybe you can play around with them a little bit. <laughs> we're trying to change that. This is the fulcrum, the place of moving that. And on our own, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, at this stage in the planet to really make significant progress that way. To working together, supporting each other, helping everybody to stay, stay focused, that has immense potential. And that is why, of course, Yogananda uh, emphasizes so much in his life that these, these, co these colonies were necessary to shepherd this new era in. So if we can take that just kind of as a focus for our lives this week and the coming week to really take that inner spiritual awareness as the ultimate, the highest point of our life and to build everything else around it. And to just, you know, if something's taking us away from it, of that focus, leave it alone. Walk away from it. To find out what, what is it in your life that takes you in that direction, embrace it. <laughs> And give your, take, willingly go with it, cooperate with it. And if, the more that we can do that, the faster we can make this process happen. The more people we can help, the less, less suffering and pain there'll be in the world and the more inner joy and inspiration. Thank you. So we must do Shiva Shiva Shambho. Mm. The words are Shiva 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 Shambho, Mahadeva Shambho. Welcome to sing along with us. <laughs> Shiva, 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 Shambo.
Thank you. 